Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us today for session 39 of our Forging Forward a virtual philanthropic conference series focused on idea sharing, innovative solutions, and a path forward. Uh, I'm your host, Brian Crimmins, Global Managing Partner of 100 and the CEO of Changing Our World. For those of you who've been with us for maybe the first time or have been with us for 39 times, I, I've said good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, I think every single week, but certainly it takes on new meaning this week with Thomas joining us from Denmark, where it is the evening. It's a little, I guess, a little after five o'clock or so. Um, so certainly we're spanning somewhat of the globe today. And uh, so without further ado, I definitely want to welcome Thomas Colster, the founder and creative director of the Good Advertising Agency for our discussion today on a consumer-led purpose and how we got here. So there's certainly a fair amount uh, to be discussed as, and I'm really, really looking forward to our, our conversation. And for those of us here in the United States and, and anywhere else uh, who may have even watched the Super Bowl, it's interesting to see some of the consumer-led brands and how they, they manifested themselves during such a big event as, as that. And so in traditional fashion, let me just give you some background on Thomas and then we will certainly jump in and into the conversation. So Thomas is an international expert in sustainable communication. He is the author of one of the most comprehensive books about the topic, Good Vertising. In his latest book, The Hero Trap, and for those of you watching on camera, I've got it held up here for you. Uh, the Hero Trap, Thomas introduces the idea that future, the future of brand purpose should not be driven by brand themselves, but instead lies in empowering consumers and individuals to pursue their own individual purpose and dreams. He suggests that brands must be answering for people, question of who you can help them become. As the director of the Good Advertising Agency, Thomas helps companies understand this reality. He also founded Where Good Grows, the world's first best practice sharing platform for sustainable initiatives. He's an experienced keynote speaker featured at such events as South by Southwest and Sustainable Brands, a columnist for The Guardian and several other publications, and a regular judge at international awards. The Huffington Post recently dubbed Thomas as an inspirational leader, and he currently sits on two nonprofit organization boards. So you can see why I'm excited to welcome Thomas to this week's Forging Forward. So welcome, Thomas. Thank you, Brian, and welcome uh, to all of you. And as Brian said, I mean, I'm calling in from Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, so if it is a little bit dark here, it is because it's 5.30 and and I have a, a cup of coffee in my hand just to kind of welcome the evening. <laughs> well, hopefully the coffee will keep the energy up for, for this conversation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so, Thomas, to get us started, uh, I would love for you to you know take us through and take the audience through the the creation of good advertising. But but really, I know you worked prior to this in in a prior life in in the world of traditional advertising. So I'm wondering wondering if you could take a few moments to kind of take us through your career path and how did it lead you ultimately to the creation of your agency? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, you know as as you said, I, I started out as a, a young kind of advertising creative at the age of probably 21 or something. I was I was a copywriter at the time and did my first nine to ten years um, in the world of agency as a as a creative. Founded my own agency five six years into my career, and and I think that you know I didn't really go into advertising because I loved advertising. I actually just loved writing. <laughs> And so it's kind of it's kind of like pure luck that I that I ended up in advertising in the sense that uh, I was at university, I was dating this girl, and at one point I was bored of university, and she said to me, you know, do you know there's something called a copywriter, and you can maybe earn some money there. So it was kind of by chance that I ended up in it. And but the thing that I always felt this weird disconnect between how I was using my creative skill set with some of the work that it's doing. I mean, you know, selling cars in cities that were already way too congested and selling cheeseburgers to people who did have some weight issues, et cetera, et cetera. And, but my, my pivot was, and, and the, the whole career change for me was that we were hosting the climate summit here in Copenhagen. So we had, you know, all the big guys there, Barack Obama was here. We had Tony Blair and all these guys and obviously hosting the climate summit you know, we probably had 
as Danes, I think the whole world was watching as well, quite high expectations of the outcome. But, uh, you know, as we all know, nothing really happened. And, and I think this was, this was probably the first time that I felt provoked enough to say, hey, wait a moment, what if brands stood up to the challenge? And, and so that, that kind of led me to, to, uh, to write, um, to write good advertising and, and which at the time was, um, the concept was sort of fairly new in the sense that, you know, using commercial brands as platforms for chains wasn't that, um, wasn't that common. I mean, it was typically, typically like the Ben and Jerry's and the doves of this world that was doing yeah. things like this. Um, so yeah, so, so that was, you know, it, it wasn't actually really in, in a way I kind of jokingly say that, you know, as a copywriter, it's, it's probably no, not the most innovative thing to write a book. That's kind of what you do as copywriters, like art directors always end up doing a, a photo book of sorts. But, but, but for me, I, the, the thing I really felt was for once I could actually combine what I love doing with my creative work with something that really kind of added meaning to my life. And, and so that was what I felt compelled by. And that was the movement that I sort of kickstarted because suddenly a lot of people in the industry felt really connected to that, to that thought as well, that they felt that same stomach wrenching, like, oh, you know, I wish I could kind of combine the two. Right. And then at the, at, at, and then at the same time, there was this, I mean, Surge that you have experienced as well. This surge in in you know there's this pressure rising towards you know commercial companies to respond to a lot of these social and environmental challenges that unfortunately just have uh, have have um, have especially when we talk about climate still still is on the on the rise unfortunately. No, oh, sure, definitely, and. It, you could take me through. I mean, how was good? I, I mean, I, I know, but I want to make sure our audience understands your good advertising, good advertising book was very well received as, as the hero trap now is. I mean, but tell me what was the initial reaction? I mean, what was some of the, with good advertising? And I know it sort of sprung you into obviously doing a lot of speaking. I mean, but just give us a window into how that was received at the time. Yeah. So what, one of the interesting things was, uh, you know, when, uh, when we're putting all these cases together in the book, uh, it, it was, and it, it might sound odd today, but it was actually difficult to find a lot of good substantial cases of brands that was doing something meaningful. And at the same time, we also wanted to, uh, pay, um, credit to a lot of that great work that nonprofits and foundations had been doing because I think obviously a lot of that hard work in terms of really creating impact has since, you know, been taken over by a lot of these kind of brands. A lot of that stuff has been, you know, assimilated. So, so in a way the book kind of both features, you know, a lot of great cases from foundations and, and nonprofits, but obviously um, from brands as well. But, but I remember when the book came out, it was, <laughs> It was kind of weird because it wasn't really like a discussion point at that time in the industry. So um, I wasn't really in the beginning invited to a lot of the festivals and all that stuff in, in the advertising world. But a lot of the people who started inviting me was uh, sustainability, the sustainability people who had been working on a lot of these issues for quite some time, but felt that they lacked, they lacked somebody who uh would 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 kind of take their side who would who would share the importance of their work in a language that you know the marketeers could understand that maybe the ceo could understand so yeah so 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 my my first <laughs> my kind of first nice community for that book was in fact the sustainability people and i'm so incredibly happy about it today because um for me, this is all about impact. This is all about how do we create real change? And I think the advertising community have so much still to learn from the impact focused approach to, uh, to how we create the necessary transformation. Uh, well said, you know, that's a perfect tee up to sort of my next question, which is the concept of purpose. And 
has been evolving. I mean, you, you took us through your own perspective of that with your, with your initial book, but would love to take a step even further back from there and get your perspective on where, where have we been uh, on this whole consumer purpose, consumer led purpose, even if we, it's been a journey for 40 plus years. We all know that, but even the last 10, if you think of it from that standpoint, Thomas, you know, where have we been and where are we at this moment? And what do you, what do you think the future holds for us? Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the, um, I, I was a big advocate for purpose and in, in some ways I still am. I just think that it, it sort of needs to evolve. Um, you know, it's almost like in the, um, you know, in the beginning, there was very, as I said, there was very few companies that kind of came across as purposeful as somebody who stood up and, and wanted to, you know, fight climate change, et cetera. And, you know, the, you know, the likes of Patagonia and, and obviously um, early examples of, you know, Anita Roddick who, who founded uh, Body Shop. And so, so there are a couple of companies that, that kind of went on that uh, journey towards purpose, um, life boy. And I mean, we, we know a lot of those examples and, and I think we, a, a lot of the work for me was then to say, you know, what, what's the business case as well for that. And I think pretty early on, we saw, wait a moment, those companies actually perform better. <laughs> they do better people love them more they they grow faster all that stuff and and then I probably three the, the thing that actually led me to to write the new book uh the hero trap that you that you uh hold up was that i started noticing something wasn't quite right anymore because suddenly there were so many new brands you know popping up talking about the role that they wanted to play in society etc so almost, I mean, I sometimes say, you know, it's, it's like uh, purpose is a little bit like Pokemon. Everybody is searching for it, but nobody really knows why <laughs> it's, it's, it's big. No, but it's honestly, it's become this thing. You know, you, you are noticing these calls. I mean, I'm sure you've received calls like that as well, where you have somebody calling you like a marketing director and he's like, you know, I'm calling for this soft drink company. We know young people care about the climate, you know, can we get a purpose? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's not that's not how it works <laughs> so 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 suddenly within the last couple of years this whole purpose space have been ex extremely congested oh. and 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 so the back side of this is in fact that a lot of people are now uh questioning their authenticity absolutely and yeah and and to be honest i mean for me, this comes back to, I think for me, the, the journey that I saw at the time was each and every time some of these companies went up and stood on that purpose pedestal and said, you know, we're going to do X, Y, Z for the climate, or we are super diverse company. And then, you know, two months into that whole spiel, the CEO does something wrong or somebody finds out that Hey, wait a moment. That board is definitely not diverse. Or <laughs> so, so that's kind of why I call it the hero trap. Because each and every time you put yourself up there as the hero, it was so easy. You know, I again and again witnessed how those brands um, kind of did those mistakes. So, so for me, I, I I started noticing something. The thing that provoked me this time, the climate summit, was my first little provocative thing like my life bulb moment and for this book it was in fact that i realized how difficult it was to create change in my own life mm. i'm sure that some of you who watch this can recognize this from yourself i mean we just had uh we, we we're now entering into a new year and i don't know how many of you do a, a new year's pledge but <laughs> the challenge of taking those pledges and making them come true it, it's tough work i mean <laughs> You know, as soon as you say, now nah, I want to go for that run, I want to lose weight. And, you know, now, you know, five weeks into, into the new year, the sneakers are probably still lying in the corridor, right? And not running themselves. So change is difficult, but, but that's exactly the question that, I, that made me think, maybe we look at change and transformation the wrong way. Because in fact, we're the only ones who can create change. 
So that's why I started to question the sort of inside out approach, the navel gazing approach, saying we as a company are the agents of change. But instead said, you know, if we really want to create change, we have to ask a different question as leaders and organizations, as brands. It's really about helping people become the agents of change. So the question you you uh, said introductory wise, who can you help people become? Yeah. And and by and, and by doing that, you're much more effective. It's it's kind of moving from being a preacher to being a coach. You know, it's interesting, Thomas, that and you're leading me into my next question perfectly about taking it a little deeper, but you know, the, the part earlier in the conversation you were talking about nonprofits and one thing that I many things that nonprofits have going for them. One thing that I find empowering about working with them is that there's this in they're in service of it's it's in their DNA. I mean some 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 have lost their way, there's no doubt. As as you said, it's hard. It's you know, but they're in their natural tendency is to be in service of those that they're providing, whether it's education, healthcare, social service, whatever it might be. And in many respects, what you're talking about in the whole kind of purpose movement that I've seen is for 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 profits is about finding that what is that what are they in service of to be honest and i and that's what i loved about the who can you help people become question that you've put forth in this the hero trap book that's what i in reading your book i kept finding myself coming back to that you know because in the work we've done over the years oftentimes uh we we find ourselves putting partnerships together for the hopefully for the better um and there was often this, at in the beginning, I'm talking 10, 12 years ago, there was a thought by the nonprofits of what do we have to offer, you know? Um, yeah. And I think it's what's come about over the last few years, I think is something more powerful than their programs. And the, the partner is actually in many respects, the ability to help the their for-profit partners understand what their true mission could be about. And, and, and so that's, anyway, that's a comment, but also leading in a bridge to my next question, which is, in the Hero Trap book, you talk about what we've just said. You, who can you help people become, right? Which is, a, on the surface, sounds like a simple question. You know, some of the best questions in life start off very simple, but they certainly yeah. run deeper de deeper than that. And so I'm wondering if you can help us understand what the premise for, you know, us, how do we incorporate, you You were talking about it, about the New Year's resolutions. I mean, how do individuals take this to heart? How, do, how do, And even if you want, keep going with where you were, if you don't mind, like how do companies take this to heart? It's such a fascinating question. Yeah, I think there's there's a, there's a couple of things to what you said. I mean, the I very I, in a way I very much see it as a evolution when we talk about what what has happened over the last decade. In a way, I see it as an evolution of purpose in the sense that you know for quite some time we bought into this sort of societal difference, this idea of buying into a purposeful company that delivered some sort of societal benefit. So you know, uh, like a more environmentally friendly car, whatever. I, I think the shift we're seeing, and I'm sure that, you know, some of some of the people who joined today who works in nonprofits will probably also be able to recognize this. But what I've seen now, especially with young people today, is that, you know, everybody can claim to play a big role in your life. But if huh. I not, if I cannot see it, if I cannot feel that difference, and, and one of the big questions I often ask when I when I work with organizations or leaders and brands is, in fact, you know, who have played a meaningful difference in your life? Who has actually helped you change? Whether whether that's, you know, you learned a new skill, made you healthier, made you think about new things. Because I think that's the true leadership. So so. In the book, I very much talk about, you know, transformational organizations that have a laser sharp focus on the change that they can enable in people's lives. Because I do see this shift that, you know, let's use Tom Shoes as an example. I mean, Tom's, uh, for those of you who don't know Tom Shoes, it was like, you know, buy one, get one. So you donate a pair of shoes to people who were, I think it was, was in, in Bolivia or somewhere they, they started uh, and and obviously had the business model has been pivoted into many different areas uh, eyeglasses water etc but 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 i think today the challenge of a model like that is you know people don't just want to buy that sort of you know that logo you know i'm i'm a you know i'm a 
I'm um, um, I'm a generous person. You need to kind of you know you need to kind of work for it a little bit, and I think that's also the the sort of self actualization, the development part of the who can you help people become that people actually want to play a part, and and I see this a lot in company programs as well. You know that that I think the successful kind of corporate nonprofit programs with employees put people out there in something that they're actually passionate about. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to take an IT guy and, and make him clean up a beach necessarily, but, but putting his coding skills to good use makes so much sense. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think, I think we're seeing this pivot. Young people don't just want to buy that, uh, that t-shirt that says, you know, I'm, I'm supporting the whales. They actually want to go out there. They want to do, they want to, they want to do their part. So there's, there's a shift happening, uh, definitely in the market at the moment. Yeah. I can't help but think of the word authentic, authentic, or, or being, you know, authenticity is so every, it's sort of the undercurrent of what you, you you've talked about too. And, and the value add, I mean, your example of the IT person, you know, going out and cleaning a beach versus putting his or her IT skills to, to use in a way that might even impact, you know, just better suited. So kind of knowing yourself as part of this process as well, both as an individual, but also as a company and what you're, what you, what you're good at, I, I should, I should say, you know, I was interested in your thoughts on the hero trap concept applying to different companies and brands. And so I'm wondering how, cause I think we've got, I, I shouldn't say, I think, I know we've got a, uh, you know, less consumer facing companies that may be listening to this or listening to the recording, you know, maybe B2B type of brands. Any thoughts or any advice on how that, how the hero trap, your book, your, your thoughts, your experiences apply to them? Yes, definitely. I think you, you actually mentioned it a little bit, the, the sense that what, what is it that, what is it that goes wrong at the moment? I mean, what's, what's the, I think a lot of people came to purpose because they were seeing, you know, they 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 felt they weren't really delivering to the customers. And I think it's really about finding that kind of meaningful role to play in people's lives, whether you're a B2B company, a B2C company, whether you're a leader, whether you're a nonprofit. And um and and and, and so for me it's really being extremely clear about that role. And 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 for B2B companies, it's exactly the same thing. You know, understanding and understanding that human side of of your customers and what it is that that they uh, they want to achieve. Uh, just the other day, I had um I had a conversation. It's it's actually a Danish company called uh, Erster, so they do offshore uh, windmills. And and one of the things they talk about is um is is really to help uh, people uh, in this green energy transition. So even though who, you know, they're not selling a windmill to me, but right. they're selling windmills to governments, to businesses, but, but in essence, kind of getting in under the skin of everyone and giving everybody a possibility to be part of that journey, you know, because as a citizen, I can put pressure on my government. I can put pressure on the businesses that I don't feel are uh, part of that renewable transition. So, so in that sense, I think it's it's as relevant for for these companies, and and I think where where they where they lose is not because they they don't necessarily have a sense of purpose. I think they 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 lack this they they lack this meaningful role to play in people's lives because it's not enough to go out and say, you know, we are the most diverse company in the world. I think what they need to do is, and I think especially now with the climate in the U.S is to help people fight their own biases to um to battle some of the stereotypes that some of us are you know are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and the brands that can help us do that i think are the ones that are going to win our hearts and minds uh, great point oh, great point and, and then piggybacking a bit a bit of where you just were my next question with the pandemic it's brought so much change to organizations and individuals. We all, we all certainly know that and continues to bring change. Wonder if you could give me your thoughts on how self-actualization is giving brands it's a bit of where we've been, but the opportunity to help consumers grasp the concept of what we are not buying and it's better, you know, the better things in life are not products and kind of things. So I'm curious, and I've got a multi 
level parts of this question, but I'm wondering, I'll, I'll start there. I mean, what, what's your thoughts on how brands can provide that opportunity for help consumers understand that? You know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to see because the, the book, the book came out in uh, June. So <laughs> launching a book in the midst of the pandemic and, and obviously the writing process uh, three years prior and and I remember I had this call in May with the publisher and the publisher was like, oh, should we do a forward to kind of, you know, add context to what's happening right now and what's going to change. And because at, at, at that stage, what I could see was, in fact, that people, people, people weren't just buying into this sort of better world, but a better me. But what we've witnessed during this pandemic is, in fact, that, you know, um, I think YouTube and one of their surveys called it the, the sourdough phenomena that suddenly we've all embraced the, this thing about baking and suddenly wanting to play guitar again or spending time with friends or you know, all these things that actually are at the very core of self-actualization of you know following our passions. And, and I think this is where there are so many untapped um, business opportunities. I can just give you a few examples. Um, so one, one of, one of, uh, one of the companies I mentioned in the book is actually out of the U S and, and they're called district vision and, and, uh, started by two young guys, Tom, Tom and Max, so the typical startup guys, you know, in the early thirties, whatever, you know, and their inside in the beginning was they looked at running glasses. So apparently glasses, you where when you're running i didn't know that i needed that but anyways people apparently do uh but but in fact the the thing they said okay let's let's do some that are a little bit more beautifully designed but what they essentially went out and, and sold was what they called mindful running this idea that uh if you don't connect your mind with your body you're going to be a lousy runner and i think a lot of us have felt that when we had that to the next lamppost type feeling and you give up and you're like, ah, so your mind is playing tricks with you. And, and what they've done is they, they do mindful running classes. Uh, right now they actually have, um, in the, um, they actually have, uh, uh, training programs now with inmates, uh, in prisons, uh, for main mi mindful training sessions. So this idea about having transformation at, at, um, as, as your core offering will eventually make it possible for you to charge for it. And, and, you know, if you look at a company like Ikea that we know for these kind of flat pack furniture and all that stuff in a way, um, just up the road from where I live now they have, um, a sort of uh, because they always have these mega malls. That's what they're known for. These like labyrinth type warehouses, but just up here they have like a um, a small design studio, and they have like fifteen designers sitting at a laptop, and you can go in there, and they help you design a home. Uh, so they they help you design a better living at home experience, which is super clever. The whole thing is being delivered uh, to your doorstep. So I think those brands who get that and, and even the same thing I see with cities at the moment, I think, unfortunately, we've our cities for so for, for an extended period of time have really just been um, designed as, you know, shopping experiences. It was all about consuming. There wasn't actually a lot you could do in a city unless you paid. And, and what I see now across cities is, in fact, that city planners are starting to look at the whole life of a citizen and they do these, um, you know, outdoor exercise stations, bike lanes, all these things, which is again, is a way for city planners to look at how can they make us as citizens more healthy. And I think that that's the sort of mindset I'm really excited about because it, it moves the business model away from just selling stuff to actually selling something that I truly feel adds value to our lives. And I think the COVID-19 have shown that, you know, that's the most basic thing. We're not driven by status and money. We, we're driven by passions. That was the thing that, that made me pivot away from was at the time was a much more uh, highly paid advertising position into, <laughs> into, 
into kind of trying trying to do an impact and combining creativity with impact. Yeah, well said. You know, Thomas, I would love your thoughts on where do you think those in the position, you know, the CMO types, you know, on the pendulum of understanding what you just went through. You know, I loved your city example. I hadn't thought of it in that context. There's not a lot. I, for those who don't know, I'm in, I'm not far from New York City. I, it, my mind quickly went there, and I thought to your comment of there's not much to do in New York City if you're not spending spending some money. But and and we're thankfully changing some of that. And you know, the bike, many of the things you, we're we're getting there. I'll put it that way. But um, I'm curious, where do you think the CMO typical CMO is on that pendulum? I mean, do you think they're understanding that? Do you think it's still now? Let's just drive drive towards selling the product. Are we you know, where are we at? 10% understood that five years ago. I don't want to put these, you know, numbers or thoughts, but where would, where do you think we are on that pendulum and, and, and are we picking up speed or, or are we slowing down? What's your thought about the future direction of this? I think at the moment, most or more and more CMOs are beginning to understand the concept of purpose. I think a lot of them do it wrong. Uh, I think a lot of them are have difficulties understanding a lot of these um, challenges around sustainability. I don't think they take it seriously enough. Uh, I mean, if you look at a lot of the FMCG companies and the issues they have around uh, packaging, for example, I, I don't think they're putting enough effort into it. I don't think they are um, taking the, um, you know, the, 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 the food movement towards kind of cleaner eating towards regenerative agriculture. A lot of these things, they're not taking seriously enough. And, and I don't, definitely don't think they're taking the whole climate uh, emergency seriously enough. So I think there's a, a, a long way for them to go. And I think one of the, one of the things that I often bring up is in fact, you know, we've, we've all seen the fate of brick and mortar stores, uh, which is not just happening in the US, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a global phenomenon right now. And I think this ties back to a lack of a meaningful role to play in people's lives. Because if all you're doing is selling product at a price, why should I engage with your store? If, if you know, I'm like, why, why, why do I want to bother going down to a store and, and dealing often with not very highly educated staff? You know, so you're not really getting anything out of it. And I think this is a really big missed opportunity for uh, brands to understand that they, they need to deliver a more transformative experience when you go down in the stores. And uh, for example, there's uh, this, um, uh, a new sports re a new sports retailer that that started out, out in Canada and it now have uh, three stores in the U.S. In fact, that's called Respect Your Universe. And one of the things they uh, have put in place they um, they don't kind of drum the typical you know this is about the athlete and it's about the sport. So they're there to help people, no matter what their goals are in life and sports. So they're there for probably ninety nine percent of us who doesn't necessarily. You know, identify ourselves with uh, Tiger Woods or you know whoever it is. I mean, and and um, but we but we might want to lose weight. We might want to do it just to get our mind off something else. And one of the things they have in their stores is they have these uh, community happenings where, let's say, you are passionate about kickboxing. You look like the guy who does a little bit of uh, kickboxing, Brian. So. You're, you're passionate about that. And now if you get enough of your uh, friends in the community to come and join, you can borrow the Respect Your Universe store for a little kickboxing session. So I think it's really about understanding that shift in mindset and, and understanding that, you know, you know, stuff is, is commodities. So unless you add that extra little value or meaning to it, you know, you don't really have a role to play in my life. Sure. No, that's a good point. Um, my, my last official question for you, Thomas, is you know, hopefully try to end here on, on a high note, which is who's doing this well? You know, who, who, who do you, who do you look up to and say, man, they've really got this figured out. 
for me, the ones that, that I really love are the ones that have an extremely clear promise. So I don't actually call it a purpose. I want to call it a promise because I think in, in, in many aspects, purpose might be a word that's too big for its own good. A promise is more like, you know, this is who I can help you become. This is what you can get out of this. This is where we can be beneficial for each other. And when you have that sort of laser sharp focus, you're not going out and saying, you know, we want to do good for people on the planet or we want to do something good for our oceans. But the more specific you can be, the easier it is to create change. And I think we can recognize that from our own lives also that, you know, if you want to run a marathon, you want to, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of do that in, 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 in you know, 10 Ks, 15 Ks, whatever it is. So let me give you one example that I really love. Um, um, it's it's a health, a health insurance company and they actually um, started out in South Africa and their promise is to incentivize people to live healthier. So it's a very, very clear promise. And uh, they've been recognized as one of the most uh, innovative health uh, insurance companies out there. And one of the things they have is they have a, a, a program they call Vitality. And basically they reward members if they buy healthy food, if they go to the gym. And by doing that, um, when, when you compare um, people who don't take part of the program with people who take part in the program, the people who take part in the program exercise 4.8 days more per month, which- Put your hands <laughs> I, up. I'd be happy. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and secondly, when we talk about, which is something I've had a keen interest in from the very first book, the business case behind you know, having a clear mission uh, or adding meaning in people's lives. Uh, they, they even have 30% less uh, hospitalization costs. So it's actually also good for the business. So those examples for me um, are really uh, crucial. And, and the last thing I want to connect to that is that we did a survey, um, or we, did, we did a piece of research where we uh, looked at classical purposeful companies uh, one of them was uh, Budweiser last year at Super Bowl. They aired this ad where they talked about uh, their commitments uh, towards um, uh, renewable um, renewable energy, so uh, uh, supporting um, windmill parks and offsetting uh, the, the brewing process. So, and they said, you know, this is uh, for a better world or brewing for a better world or whatever the, the tagline was. And, and when you compare that to transform transformative messaging, the difference between the two is that people feel 29.5% uh, more um, motivated and average by the, by the campaigning, by the brands that tell you, you know, this is who we can help you become rather than the company talking about it, its own accolades. That's a big number. Yeah. And, and the same, the same goes for nonprofits. In fact, I mean, uh, there was a campaign out of UK from uh, an organization called Sports UK. Uh, they ran a campaign called uh, "This Girl Can," which was basically about getting um, women who, in a way, the same insight as to talk about with respect to universe, but women who doesn't really see themselves as you know your typical you know sports person. They're not you know they don't fancy sports that much but they would love to go for a walk with the friends. So they'd like to go for like a, a small, um, you know, whatever. And, and for them just to get up there to exercise and, and that campaign again from Sports UK was extremely uh, successful in getting a target group that didn't see themselves as somebody who would like to exercise, leaving the couch and getting up there. So I think there's, there's much that can be learned both in the nonprofit space and, and in the, in the um, kind of more kind of corporate brand world, uh, if you if you embrace this sort of transformative uh, leadership thinking, sure. And in, and to bring it full circle too, as you, you gave great two great examples there of where it can make the help make the individual person better and healthier, and, and then the example you gave too of in the setting of a company, you know the the pro, the, the the less you know hospitalizations, the more they're committed. I mean, it just it works on both levels, being very sort of circular in nature in terms of uh, the feeling good, doing good work, contributing to. I mean, all this starts that sort of hamster wheel in a good way of everything moving in the direction, momentum uh, for the better, which which is certainly terrific. So, um, 
first of all, thank you, Thomas, for, for joining, taking a time out uh, of your day, particularly uh, late in the Friday afternoon, e early evening for you. Uh, so I, I understand that and I appreciate you carving out time to, to certainly join us today and, and, and share your wisdom with us. So thank you for that. And in customary fashion for us, just any any final thoughts, any any words of wisdom for those listening today or who will listen to the recording afterwards? Any final thoughts from your perspective? For me, it's always, I mean, change, change is always difficult. It's always kind of difficult to, you know, to check in new ideas, new thoughts, et cetera. So one thing I often say to people is that, you know, if they just take one piece of information away from this conversation and put into work tomorrow, then, then I'm happy. Don't try and change the whole world uh, <laughs> at yeah. one go, but just think about that one little thing. And and one one piece of advice I, I usually share is, which is very simple, when you do your communication or when you look at uh, the brand or the organization you work for, try and avoid the hero trap. And it's it's really basic. It's just stop pitching yourself as the hero. Stop talking about all the great stuff you as an organization are doing, but really try and understand uh, how can you turn your customers, uh, your nonprofit partners, your business partners into the heroes uh, in their lives. And it's a very simple advice. And if, if I'd be happy if people just embraced that tomorrow morning uh, when they, not tomorrow morning because it's Saturday, but Monday morning when they go back to work. Well, well said. It's, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's not about you. It's, it's a line that's an important one. And it's a simple version of what you said. So th Thomas, thanks again. I, uh, for those of you who, again, who may not have caught it, uh, The Hero Trap is his latest book. Uh, I've read this one and I'm working backwards to good advertising. So can't wait. Uh, I've got it here in the States. We've got a nice long weekend coming up with Monday being a holiday. So may, may add that to the, if they add that to the good advertising to the, uh, to the reading list this weekend. So thanks again, uh, uh, Thomas. This was really enjoyed it. Uh, I knew I would. And hopefully for all of you listening today or listening to the recording, you, you've learned, as he said, one thing you can take away with you. Uh, for our, from, from our standpoint, Forging Forward will continue with, with, as its name says, and we'll continue next week, uh, same time, same place. I'm excited to say our title for next week will be Making Data Analytics Work for You. Uh, I'll, I'll be joined by Nathan Chappelle, Senior VP at DonorSearch Analytics, and Bill Tedesco, CEO of DonorSearch, to talk about some fascinating things and new things that they're doing in the space, uh, particularly for nonprofits utilizing data and, and more recently AI uh, to bring insights to, to our nonprofit clients and their clients in a much more rapid fashion. So looking forward to that. We'll be here again, same time, same place next week. Thank you all again for joining us today. Continue to stay healthy, stay well, and I uh, hope everybody has a lovely weekend. Thanks, Thomas.